Hi, everyone. Welcome to the 2021 Hot Topics in Environmental Law Summer Lecture Series. I'm Jenny Rushlow, Associate Dean for Environmental Programs at Vermont Law School. We're very pleased to welcome you here today for our last presentation in this series. If you've um, been looking to get Vermont CLE credit for these talks, please keep track of what you've attended in order to claim that credit. We'll have time for Q&A after the presentation today, so I encourage you to type any questions that you have at any time in the chat box, um, and, and they can just hang out there until we get to the discussion at the end. Today, we're very pleased to welcome Lisa Held. Lisa is the senior policy reporter for Civil Eats, where she covers food and environmental policy and various other aspects of food and agriculture from local food justice initiatives to multinational meatpacking companies. She covers the food system and the environment for many additional publications, and her stories have been published by the New York Times, the Washington Post, Eater, and NPR. She also publishes a weekly newsletter on Substack called Peeled and produces and hosts the weekly podcast, The Farm Report on Heritage Radio Network. Lisa is here at VLS as one of our 2021 Summer Media Fellows, selected from a highly competitive pool of applicants, and we've really enjoyed having her here this summer. And today she'll present a talk titled, The Corporate Capture of Agricultural Climate Solutions. Please join me in welcoming Lisa Held. Thank you so much, Jenny. Um, I am so thrilled to be here. I have really, um, been grateful for this opportunity to be a media fellow at Vermont Law School over these last two weeks and am really excited to be here with all of you doing my talk today. Um, as Jenny mentioned, uh, I do a lot of things, but uh, my main gig right now is I am the senior policy reporter at Civil Eats, which is a daily news source for critical thought about the American food system. So we cover the food system across a range of um, issues and areas, including labor, immigration, health and nutrition, and definitely the environment um, is a major focus of our reporting. And yeah, so I am just gonna get started by sharing my screen with you and we will jump right in. Okay, so hopefully everyone is seeing um, my slides. So uh, as Jenny mentioned, um, the name of my talk is the Corporate Capture of Agricultural Climate Solutions. Um, before I jump in, um, I wanna just break down a little bit um, about what I mean by that. So uh, first of all, when I say solutions, um, what I'm mainly gonna be talking about are policy solutions. So they could be private initiatives or government programs, a mix of the two, but they're essentially ideas that are being discussed right now that would use taxpayer money or government support in some way to both reduce agriculture's climate impacts and involve farmers in bigger climate mitigation measures. And, you know, we know that this is um, a really important time uh, for these discussions. There was just new research that came out in January 2021 that found that even if we stop burning fossil fuels immediately, we wouldn't be able to meet the goals of the Paris Agreement without reducing emissions from the food system. So this is a really, really big, timely topic. Um, and also, I, I should say, I'm gonna be scratching the surface of some of these issues. These are big, complicated discussions. And um, in this short time period, I'm not gonna, be able to get into a lot of um, the nitty gritty details, but I'm gonna do my best to just share some of my reporting and some other reporting um, to kind of give a little bit of um, a glimpse at some of these specific issues. So um, before I move on, um, I just wanna point out this picture that I put on the first slide is um, a farmer named Keith Olinger. He runs a farm in uh, Western Maryland. I went out to visit him, I think last year, or maybe the year before, um, to report a story on a system called Silvo Pasture. So he um, operates this farm where he grazes livestock, um, intensively grazes them to build soil health, and he plants trees, systems of trees. He actually 
build fences with living trees. Um, you can't really see that in this picture. Maybe in the, the far back, you can kind of start to see the outline of it. Um, he's walking in his pollinator meadow here. Um, this is just this kind of sort of advanced climate um, positive farm system that, that he's experimenting with. And I put this picture here because I thought it kind of encompasses what I think people probably imagine or visualize when they think of climate solutions related to agriculture or regenerative agriculture. Um, and, you know, I think, unfortunately, some of the solutions that are being discussed are not going to look like this, and we're going to get into that. But I wanted to kind of just have a, a real farmer as a, a little bit of a framework. So the other thing I want to talk about, actually, I'm going to go back before I jump into that quote, is just when I say corporate capture, um, I want to, I actually really don't like that phrase, and I, I'm not sure why I used it. It's a little dramatic, but my intent is not to tell you about how big food and agriculture corporations are bad um, or, you know, point fingers. Um, it's just to kind of point to this moment of massive change we're in and explain um, some reporting that can give us an understanding of how these companies um, are going to attempt to potentially steer or benefit from these changes. So. Um, Biden's USDA is already implementing climate programs. Congress is talking about the connection between food and climate in new ways. Um, a lot is happening that's going to shape the future. And so some questions I'm thinking about as a journalist covering this space is how are the agriculture companies that have historically wielded power and influence in this space responding to that? You know, my job is to hold power to account. Um, questions like are the most popular policies being discussed who's in the room, our food and, and ag um, interests in that room, and, and what are they asking for? Um, in the race to shift funding towards climate-friendly agriculture, who's really going to benefit? So what will the real impact of the policies be? And, and really, at the end of the day, will meaningful climate action be thwarted by corporate interests in the way that action on other issues, say antibiotic use or pesticide reform, has been in the past? So this quote from John Kerry, um, I added here. So this is from a recent interview he did um, with the New Yorker Radio Hour. And he was asked about how he is going to kind of move people along on making changes to their diets uh, at, that would help um, with climate action. And he said, I don't believe people will necessarily have to eat differently. Uh, agriculture will change. Um, and he talks about some research that's being done and the economic analyses. And he says, I just think we're looking at a remarkable transformation. This will be the biggest transformation since the industrial revolution, literally. And I thought this was really telling because Kerry and, and a lot of other people in the administration and in DC are talking about jobs, money, technological solutions. And you know, not for better or for worse, that that's just the framework that a lot of this um, is being um, is being put into. And so, you know, that's a different framework from we need to change what we're doing in terms of the food system right now. We need to rein in um, bad practices. It's a very different framework. So I think it's it's good to just have that in mind. Okay, so. First of all, I'm going to talk about some examples of how um, big agricultural companies um, and sort of the, the agribusiness interests that have a lot of power are currently um, involved in shifting their messaging around environmental impacts of farming and, and climate change specifically. So this slide, um, if you look at this timeline that I pulled, this is from an Inside Climate News article. And they created a timeline of some of the Farm Bureau's um, kind of highlights of their lobbying over the years. Um, and, and basically, you know, the, the takeaway is that the Farm Bureau, which, which represents the biggest agricultural companies in this, in this country, um, certainly represents some commodity farmers as well. Um, so basically, you know, for decades, they have been aggressively lobbying to thwart any and all environmental regulations related to farming, um, many of which are related to climate. And um, this timeline ends in 2012, but another big um, initiative they were involved in since then, for example, is they were lobbying on the waters of the, the US rule, which um, was promulgated under President Obama. And 
um, it would have extended Clean Water Act protections to more waterways, essentially, in the U.S. And the Farm Bureau was was really, really big in, in fighting that rule. And um, and then I, I have this quote from from Zippy Duval, who's the the head of the Farm Bureau, and you know he's just talking about here how. Um, the Farm Bureau really worked hard to put, put Trump in the White House and, and were successful that the first time. And, um, you know, we know that um, President Trump, while in the White House, rolled back in a, a massive number of environmental regulations, uh, including uh, the Waters of the U.S. rule. So, so that was then. Um, this is now. It's all actually kind of happening at the same time. But... Um, <laughs> So the Food and Agriculture Climate Alliance is a new um, organization that was formed and the Farm Bureau is the main uh, organizer behind this alliance. And so their messaging has really changed. They're spearheading this alliance. They're saying, you know, something kind of like, well, farmers are already environmental stewards and they have an important role to play in climate solutions. And they're, they're coming out and, and putting themselves um, in these talks about climate action and farming. And this alliance, it involves, um, it does involve a lot of mainstream environmental groups like um, Nature Conservancy and Environmental Defense Fund, and also some other food and ag groups like the National Farmers Union. But it also has a very strong showing from industry, um, including groups like CropLife America, which represents the uh, nation's pesticide industry, and um, groups like the National Pork Producers Council, which represents um, industrial pork production. Um, here's another example. This one is actually brand new. This, this was just announced um, definitely within the past month. Um, this is an alliance called Protein Pact. Um, and this alliance um, says that its, its uh, mission is to strengthen animal proteins contributions to healthy people, healthy animals, healthy communities, and a healthy environment. Um, and so this was created primarily by the North American Meat Institute, um, also known as NAMI. So they are a extremely powerful lobbying group for the biggest meatpacking companies like JBS, Smithfield, Tyson. Um, and so, you know, we're talking about meat companies that primarily are in the business of um, selling meat from concentrated animal feeding operations or CAFOs. Um, and this is an alliance that is also going to be um, kind of pulling in lots of industry par partners like the United Soybean Board, also the National Pork Producers Council. Um, oh, there's a lot of overlap between these different groups. Um, and, it, and it pulls in other alliances. So it, it, it involves this something called the U.S. Roundtable for Sustainable Beef, which its members are like Cargill and Tyson, Burger King, Walmart. So this is kind of another example of just industry coming together and saying, hey, we are, um, we're involved in this conversation about climate and, and we want um, a seat at the table. So those are kind of big alliances. And this is just an example of an individual company that I wanted to share that I reported on earlier this year. So um, this was in April, JBS, which is the biggest beef and pork processor in the world based in Brazil, but has a huge presence in the US as well. Um, they ran a full page ad in the New York Times in April that said, as you can see, agriculture can be part of the climate solution. Bacon, chicken wings, and steak with net zero emissions, it's possible. There was a lot more to the ad, but um, I couldn't fit it in the picture. <laughs> so, um, you know, this is really significant because JBS is not a company you think of and you think, oh, they, you know, they're really going for it on climate. Um, they have mainly, um, well, they've been in the news a lot recently for the bribes that they were um, busted for paying um, to help their acquisition of Pilgrim's Pride, which is another big chicken company in the US. Um, but, you know, I did some reporting on, um, in, this, in this story on my, my Substack newsletter appeals about the kind of picking apart the actual commitments that they made that they were advertising here. Um, they were kind of committing to reducing emissions from some parts of their supply chain, but not all, reducing emissions intensity, not absolute emissions, which is a whole other topic. Um, and then the net zero, of course, would be coming from offsets, which um, there are a lot of issues with them that I'll talk more about later. But um, I just wanted to point out kind of the most misleading aspect 
was this kind of declaration that uh, the company would end Amazon deforestation in its supply chain by 2025. Um, when it actually had made that exact same commitment in 2009. And um, not only did it fail to meet at that time, but um, the environmental group that tracks these things um, has ranked GBS as the number one for, for deforestation in, in some critical ecosystems in South America. So, I mean, the, the big takeaway here is just that, you know, these companies like JBS, they're declaring, like, we care about climate change, we're part of the solution. Um, and we need to be paying attention to that messaging. So, so why? Why are they? Why are they doing this? Um, so, I think. I mean, these are just some headlines I included. One is a story I did um, with the new House Ag uh, Chairman, where he said climate change is one of his priorities. There's an article from Modern Farmer saying, you know, Biden is setting the farm on climate. So, there's, as I mentioned before, the, there's a lot of talk about this. Um, but I mean, I, I want to give them. Um, the benefit, I don't know if this is giving them the doubt, but really um, there is an aspect where I'm sure, you know, these companies are thinking about preventing disaster. That if, you know, anyone looks at the science, they need to be thinking about how to secure their supply chains as the climate changes. So I'm sure that's part of it. Um, but consumer demand and public image um, are obviously huge right now as um, consumers are thinking more about making choices related to climate impact. Um, Preventing regulation, so this is big. They, you know, food and agriculture companies historically want to be in the room saying, we'll do this, but we were absolutely on board. It has to be voluntary. So this is, um, I, I heard Zippy Duval in multiple hearings this year say that word over and over, voluntary, voluntary, voluntary. And a lot of senators will kind of parrot it back in hearings. Um, to just like give them to say, yep, we get it. And so it's, it's kind of just a, we show up to make sure that you're, that there aren't harsher regulations that are gonna be put on um, the agriculture sector when it comes to climate. Um, and then of course profit. So um, there's a lot of money. There's, there's government funding flowing this way. There's private funding flowing this way. And um, that's, you know, they, they wanna be in line to, to benefit. Okay, so I'm going to talk about two of these kind of agricultural climate solutions. Um, they're very specific and they both, they kind of overlap a little bit. So I decided to focus on these two. Um, but just before I do that, I just wanted to note that um, there are many more um, that could fit into this category of agricultural climate solutions. This is in no way comprehensive. So for instance, fake meat, um, both plant and cell based is really big right now. Um, it's mostly getting venture capital funding, but advocacy groups are definitely working to push it into the policy arena. Um, there's seaweed. I just did some reporting on um, big companies getting into seaweed production for civil eats. Um, so there, there's a lot of other things, but we're, I'm just going to focus on these two. So starting with methane capture or biogas, um, this is also referred to as uh, factory farm biogas or renewable natural gas. So you can see, um, depending with what you think of this idea, um, you might call it something very different. Um, so, you know, the, the, this is sort of just the basic idea. You know, industrial scale dairies and hog farms, that's mostly what we're talking about when we talk about uh, methane capture and biogas. They hold waste from their animals in lagoons and as that waste break down, breaks down, it releases methane. And we know that methane is 25 times more potent than CO2 as a greenhouse gas. So reducing methane is really important right now. And so the, the basic solution is, well, we can capture that methane, convert it to biogas, biomethane, and then distribute it via natural gas pipelines as a renewable fuel source. So, um, the way this works right now, um, there, there are many dairies in California that are already operating these. Um, and there are some examples on the East Coast. There's actually a Vermont example that I found um, that is in Salisbury that uh, was built with Vanguard Renewables. And it, it's, a, it's a smaller dairy operation as far as these um, projects usually go. And they're also putting food scraps into the digester 
um, in order to get enough waste to, to run it um, efficiently and the energy is being purchased by Middlebury. And so this, that's kind of an example of what I think people think of when you think of digesters and, and these capturing methane and, and sort of creating this small closed loop system that you're immediately getting the energy back. Um, but that's not what most of this is gonna look like in the future. So we're gonna get into that. So these are the big issues that experts and advocates are talking about right now around this idea of methane capture. Um, I'm gonna run through the first two real quick because they're not related to this kind of idea of um, corporate influence. And then I'm gonna focus on the, the last two. So, um, oh, first actually, let me just say, so there isn't current legislation on this or, or you know, a, a current USDA policy that's explicitly um, supporting this, but it's it's definitely just one of these things that is being talked about um, consistently, and um, you know, offset markets that exist now are already paying um, these operations for sequestering methane or se sequestering, yeah, <laughs> for capturing methane um, for their carbon reduction. So um, it's it's definitely growing, and and there's going to be a lot more um, conversations about it in in DC. So um, big problem. So the first one, shift climate of efforts away from elect electrification towards continued reliance on gas. Um, you know, the vast majority of natural gas is still gonna come from fracking. Um, it's, uh, yeah, so this is gonna represent a very small portion of that. And, and many people say, well, if we keep adding to the kinds of gas we're, we're putting into these systems, it just prolongs the transition away from fossil fuels. Um, and kind of along the same lines, the low price means systems rely on offsets for profitability. So um, these systems are very expensive um, to set up, to build, and then also to run. And fracked natural gas is always going to be cheaper than hog or dairy biogas from the conversations I've had with experts. So essentially, like companies can't make the economics work by solely selling the gas as energy. So they need offset markets. Um, right now, it's California has the low carbon fuel standard and their cap and trade program, um, but they, they need to be paid for the service of capturing the methane in order for it to make economic sense to build these, essentially. So these are the big kind of takeaways in terms of how this might lead to kind of um, bigger uh, agribusiness companies benefiting and, and more consolidation. So in order to power digesters, you need a lot of manure. And for it to be economically feasible, you need even more. So, you know, there's some research that puts the capital costs at building these, it's definitely millions of dollars. Um, and it's expensive to run annually, as I mentioned. So some estimates put the feasibility, for instance, on a dairy at around 3,000 to 3,500 cows. So, um, these are large operations that are able to make this work. Um, and, you know, that's, so say we're talking about a 3,500 cow dairy, and that's not even, for some of the, these operations in the West, that's not even um, nearly close to the top level of so in terms of size. Um, but, you know, that's a lot of animals in one place. And all the other impacts of, uh, capos of that size remain, right? So water quality issues, you know, there might be air quality issues, obviously any animal welfare concerns, if you have concerns about um, animals being confined in, in small, you know, concentrated areas, that, that's all gonna um, still be there. Public health risks, um, you know, associated with antibiotic use, for instance, um, used in hog farms and large dairies. So it, by kind of, um, creating a new revenue stream for these kinds of farms, um, essentially what um, a lot of people are, are pointing out is that we're creating new revenue streams for them and all these other issues still remain and are probably not good for the environment or um, people living in these areas. Um, and of course, also, so on the in terms of tipping the scales further, uh, 
small dairies who are doing grass fed or regenerative grazing, hog farms raising pigs on pasture and woodlands in diversified systems, they're certainly not going to benefit from these. They're, they can't, they don't even have lagoons to, because they're not creating those emissions, so they don't have methane to capture. And so it's essentially creating a new um, income stream for these large operations where these smaller, maybe diversified operations that are trying to do things differently are not going to benefit. So this is just a little, um, I wanted to give you a kind of a sneak peek at some of my reporting on these issues. Um, this is actually reporting I'm, I'm doing right now and the story has not come out yet. So it is literally a sneak peek and I'm not gonna, I'm gonna try not to give away what the crux of this story is gonna be. <laughs> um, hopefully you'll read it when it comes out on the release uh, very soon. But I have been looking into um, this project that uh, Smithfield and Dominion Energy are building in Utah. Well, built, it's, this project is uh, actually already up and running, as you can see the headline. Um, they're calling it the first of its kind renewable natural gas project in Utah. Um, they, it, you can see in the, I don't know if you can read this on the slide, but it, it basically they, they're saying the project is now producing renewable natural gas from a network of 26 family farms that raise hogs under contract with Smithfield. So I'm going, oh, and this is the first, so they're doing this in Utah now, and then they're also working on systems in North Carolina, Virginia, and a couple other states. So this is a huge push, and um, it's just, they're just gonna keep expanding it and, and building um, more of these um, natural gas uh, pipelines, specifically all, these projects are all hog farms. So this is a Google Maps screenshot, something I use a lot when I'm trying to understand what um, landscapes look like. Um, these buildings that are used um, for um, CAFO production are big enough that you can see them on the satellite. So this is the county that the project I was just talking about, this um, Smithfield um, methane capture project is is located in the the project that they are building includes 26 farm sites permits that they filed um, that i've reviewed uh, say that they had planned for each site to have four hog finisher barns with 4800 hogs per barn which means that the complex that is providing this um, natural gas it would the, the actual complex of 26 farm sites would have just under about 500,000, close to half a million hogs at a time in this one farm complex. And one thing to point out is, so this picture is, this is not actually, let me see how to explain this. There, there are, I think, there are at least two other farm, hog farm complexes in the same um, two counties in Utah. So it's hard to parse out by looking at the maps, which are which. So this might not be the exact complex, but that's it actually speaks to um, kind of what we're talking about is not only are there these, you know, we know that there are half a million hogs in this one complex, but there are actually many, many more that are already there. Um, so it's just a really, really high level of concentration and consolidation. Um, and you can, you can take this map and um, compare it to the natural gas pipeline maps um, that the federal government provides and see how the pipeline kind of runs through this area. Um, so it gives them access to tapping into that. Um, so, so my story is going to look into some bigger questions about actual emissions reduction value of, of projects like these. But, you know, we can just think about like, well, what other impacts it might these farms have? I mean, the numbers here, um, again, in terms of animal welfare, the impacts would be pretty obvious. And then um, a big one here, I think, would be water use. So there's persistent drought in this um, already normally very dry region right now. Utah is actually fighting with um, surrounding states in the Colorado River Basin over water access. So um, that could be another impact that we should consider. 
Okay, so that was methane capture biogas. I'm going to briefly talk about carbon markets. Um, so, and I should say, I'm really talking about agricultural carbon markets. There are different kinds of carbon markets. Um, but essentially, um, the way I've laid it out here, you know, agriculture contributes to climate change via greenhouse gas emissions from land use, input production, nitrous oxide emissions in fields, methane from livestock. But on the flip side, healthy soil when properly managed can also capture and hold carbon, um, potentially contributing to climate action uh, by sequestering that carbon. So the idea is that um, in order to incentivize farmers to adopt those practices that sequester carbon, carbon markets sell credits to companies that want to offset their emissions. So in this case, they'd be purchasing those credits and farmers are providing are getting paid for the sequestration. The company gets to say, well, sure, we emitted this, this amount of uh, CO2 equivalents in the past year, but then we paid this farm and they sequestered it. And so it evens out essentially. So it seems, seems pretty straightforward, I guess. Um, oh, and I should also say that carbon markets already exist. I mentioned earlier, I think California's um, cap and trade market, but that one is really different because it has a cap. So um, companies are certain companies in certain industries that are that emit a lot of um, that have high emissions, they're only they're given a certain threshold and then they have to offset what, when they go over. Whereas um, most of the, the agricultural carbon markets that exist so far don't involve a cap. They're just totally voluntary. Um, so, you know, companies just that want to offset can, but it, it's not required. Of course, I should also say though that these ideas, there's so many different ideas, but actually we'll talk about this on this slide. So there's so many different ideas related to carbon markets um, and in agriculture that are circulating right now. And um, I, I wanna talk about the Growing Climate Solutions Act, but first I, I should say, um, so the, the Biden administration has, has pointed to carbon markets before. Um, Biden, uh, the USDA actually appointed Robert Bonney, who's an advocate for what, what he calls a carbon bank um, to for a climate position within USDA, and, and he hasn't been confirmed yet, but likely will be. And um, so that a carbon bank is a little bit different from private carbon markets. So they're talking more about um, the federal government taking a, a larger role in potentially paying farmers for, for carbon credits. And in this case, the Growing Climate Solutions Act um, is a bipartisan bill that was introduced by uh, Senators Braun and Stabenow, and it passed the Senate in June, which is pretty amazing right now. Not much is passing the Senate. <laughs> um, and that would kind of um, essentially it, sort of top level, it would support, it would kind of direct the USDA, the federal government to support the growth of private carbon markets to kind of help standardize some of the practices that are being used um, right now in, because the, there are various markets and they're all doing things differently. And it's a little bit of a um, wild west, I think. So I wanted to just show a little bit um, of this, this act, um, it, it is kind of miraculous that it got passed in, the, in this moment of um, how difficult it is to get things through the Senate right now. And one of the reasons I think it passed is because it had huge industry support, um, which is relevant to this conversation. So it got tons of support from environmental groups as well, which I should say. Um, the more progressive side of environmental groups are not supporting it, but um, kind of the, a, a lot of them are. And um, you can also see though that we've got Cargill, Bayer, um, Syngenta, McDonald's. So this is a, and the Farm Bureau, of course, so industry likes this, this um, bill. So here are the issues that um, advocates and experts are, are bringing up when it comes to agricultural carbon markets. First one, um, research. So none of the um, research that we have so far, what we know so far from a scientific perspective on on-farm carbon sequestration is kind of at a point where 
most people think it's just not at a point where we could really say, okay, this, this, if we do this thing, it's going to sequester this much carbon and we can pay for that amount of carbon. Um, there's a long way to go. So we have to answer questions like how much carbon can soils really hold? How long does that carbon stay there? If you till it once, is it just gone? Um, how far down is it being sequestered? Um, that's a really important um, aspect that sometimes doesn't even get measured in studies. Um, how to measure if you're going to pay farmers for, for sequestration, how are we measuring it? There are different tools or are we doing it, paying them by practice instead of by actual carbon? So there's a lot of, a lot of um, unanswered questions at this point. Um, and then the effic efficacy of offsets. So this is complicated, but I just wanted to bring it up quickly. Um, ProPublica has done some really incredible investigations that show offsets often don't reduce emissions at the rate they're, they're actually measured at or sold at. Um, one problem is, you know, if we, if we pay a farmer because they have a certain amount of carbon in their soil, we don't know what the, that amount would have been if they had not been paid. What would they have done? It's hard to say. Well, maybe they would have planted a cover crop, but they wouldn't have, but they would have tilled or maybe they, so it, it's hard to say um, th this is exactly how much carbon um, resulted in a change in what they were doing and therefore it represents a meaningful reduction in the overall amount of carbon in the atmosphere. Okay, so moving into um, our focus today, sort of the, the corporate side. So just like methane and biogas capture, um, most of what we're seeing so far in terms of how carbon markets are structured suggests that the biggest farms are the ones that are going to benefit. Um, and specifically commodity farms. So right now, um, the rates are about $15 to $20 per acre. So if you're a regenerative, diversified 20-acre farm, well, first of all, some of, them, some of the markets don't even um, take farms that aren't commodity. Um, but also, like, if you're 20 acres and you're getting paid $20 per acre, $400 isn't really going to do much to, to help um, <laughs> improve the economic viability of your farm. But if you're a 3,000 acre commodity farm, you know, 60K is, is pretty significant. So there's a scale um, preference for sure. Change in practices. Um, most of these markets require a farmer to change one or two things they're doing in order to get paid. So maybe it's reducing tillage or fertilizer use, um, planting cover crops I mentioned. So essentially, the markets do that because they want to be able to say they made this change. It likely led to this much more carbon in the soil. So that means it can represent an offset. But, you know, that obviously then exempts or leaves out the most sort of um, innovative farms that have been doing kind of climate um, leading work for years. So again, like a diversified regenerative organic farm that has been really just doing the work for years um, and prioritizing biodiversity and, um, and internalizing those costs along the way, they're not, there's likely not gonna be a, a little change they can make to say, well, we made this change and so now we can qualify for a credit. Um, and it's important for me to point out that's not a flaw, that's actually essential to the design because as I mentioned earlier, for an offset to truly represent meaningful emissions reductions, net reductions, it has to represent new capture, right? So again, just like kind of the, the summary bullet is that like methane and biogas, um, because of these issues, the fear is that if carbon markets work for any farmers, it will be commodity farmers with thousands of acres that can get paid to make a relatively small practice change in the, the grand scheme of things. And, you know, therefore, this will further tip the scale towards the status quo, towards the same kind of production that um, dominates our agricultural landscape now. Okay, so this is just to kind of sum up, I just wanted to share, um, this is a story I did on, on carbon markets for The Guardian earlier this year. And, um, I started by showing you a farmer 
and I wanted to end by with the voice of a farmer. And so for this story, I talked to um, Nicole and Aaron Bradley. They run a diversified livestock farm in North Carolina, which is pretty amazing because um, North Carolina is the second biggest pork producing state in the U.S. And after Iowa. And, you know, they're raising hogs in a place where hog production means manure lagoons and, and capos, but they're doing it 200 pigs at a time on pasture and in wooded areas. Um, you know, the, the manure gets integrated into the ground naturally as fertilizer. They move, they have 40 grass-fed cattle. They move them in a mob grazing system to maximize soil health with laying hens following behind. And they really prioritize biodiversity and ecosystem stewardship. And I talked to Aaron um, about carbon markets, about methane capture, and his sort of assumption was, well, of course, firms like mine won't benefit. And whatever dollars are going to pro programs like these, he was sort of, you know, he kind of said, yeah, it, it makes sense that they'll, they'll likely go to industrial scale farms um, because in his mind, that's just kind of the way things go. And um, I thought this quote that I included was just important to sort of end on. So he said, you know, while his farm can't compete with the price efficiency of industrial scale animal operations, it's more efficient in other ways, quote, in preserving natural resources and managing ecosystems that can hold carbon. Our policymakers are disconnected from what our style of agriculture is. And I'm not sure they believe we can really be productive. All right, so that is it. Um, I just did this slide at the end um, with my contact information. These are some of my recent stories on Civil Eats. Um, I would love if you wanna talk to me, um, I'm gonna take questions now, but if at any point you wanna uh, reach out and uh, send me a story idea, ask me a question, chat more about this topic, um, my email is here and I'm happy to um, interact with you. Okay. Um, I'm ready for questions, Jenny, whenever you are. Okay. Awesome. Great. Thank you so much for that talk, Lisa. Um, sure. For our listeners, um, if you would like to ask a question and you're watching our website live stream, you just click on the icon at the bottom of the video to bring up the chat box where you can log in and add your question and the login is super easy. Um, and if you're watching our Facebook live stream, add your question to the comment box below and we'll try to get through as many questions as possible. So Lisa, first question there, um, in the context of carbon markets for um, uh, sectors other than agriculture, there've been a lot of criticisms from the environmental justice community around distributional justice. And um, you know the reduction of carbon um, and the use of offsets, just sort of relocating pollution into areas that are already disproportionately overburdened. Um, how have you seen any um, racial or economic justice criticisms of the use of carbon markets in agriculture? That's such a great question, and. Um, definitely something that I'm thinking about a lot. Um, I don't have a specific example of, but one thing that I that I am thinking about is, so for instance, um, the example I showed of the Smithfield um, Dominion project, I haven't been able to confirm yet that they are definitely getting offsets from California's um, cap and trade or low carbon fuel standard market, but um, they did say in another article that that was something that they were, someone from the company said that was something they were looking into. And so one, this, an example of where, where this would fit into your question is um, they're installing lots of these um, biogas digesters right now in North Carolina, where historically the concentration of um, hog farms there is a huge environmental justice problem. I mean, these communities have been hammered for years and there's been tons of reporting all over on how the pollution, the air quality um, has affected primarily um, low-income black communities in North Carolina. And so in this case, 
this would be an example where potentially if, if Smithfield is getting paid by a, a, a you know an offset market to essentially capture the methane there, it's just giving them kind of a financial incentive to continue business as usual otherwise on those farms in North Carolina where the people being affected by those operations are low income people of color. So I think I think it's a really big thing to, to be looking out for and there will be many other examples um, that yeah, I'm, I'm sure popping up and we'll have to be paying attention to. There are examples of um, pollution trading um, in the area where you're from in terms of like water quality, um, pollution credits trading, I think in the Chesapeake Bay, right? Is that is that something that the, and that came first in terms of this um, like pollution trading idea in agriculture before carbon markets were contemplated? Has there been any learning from that earlier attempt? I'm not sure. Do you mean, are you talking about like um, paying um, for paying farmers not to put like nitrogen and phosphorus in the Chesapeake Bay, like that kind of thing? Yeah, I, yeah. I know that that exists. I, it's not something I've covered a lot. And unfortunately, I don't um, know a lot about how that would potentially relate. Um, I know there are some, there's some talk right now about new markets to pay um oyster farmers to remove nitrogen from like for, for the ecosystem benefits of putting oysters in the Chesapeake Bay and essentially paying like people who are, are polluting the bay with nitrogen could pay for credits um, that go to oyster farmers to remove that nitrogen. So it that does have a little, it, it seems like a similar structure, but I don't know enough about it to know if there are you know, problem, potential problems with it or, or what the real impacts have been. Okay, thank you. Is there any way to allow for biogas generation in a way that doesn't support CAFOs? Well, so it's a good question. I think you need a concentrated source of manure. So, I mean, it's pro it's always, I mean, I, I'm saying always, but I, I, you know, there's also like a lot of innovation happening right now. So who knows what will happen, what will change, you know, how these things will potentially improve. Right now, what we know is that you need a, a lot of um, waste in one place. And when we talk about CAFOs, I mean, it, the examples I was showing were like massive, right? But there are examples where it might still be quote unquote, like a, a CAFO the way that EPA would define it, you know, a thousand livestock units or more. So with that, that's with cows, it would be a thousand cows. Um, but it, it, that, that would be, you know, potentially small compared to a large CAFO. So there are different sizes. And so I think there are ways to do it on smaller livestock operations that might still be considered a CAFO, but might not have the same like massive impacts and might also be run by, um, you know, more like an individual family farm and not be, you know, these big developments that the larger companies are going to cash in on. So like for the example I gave in Vermont, I think, I think that farm had 900 cows, which is pretty small for a, um, industrial dairy, but it's, you know, it's still bit, it's still large, but, um, it's small enough that it's not, it, it doesn't look like the same thing compared to some of these other um, massive operations. So I think there's a difference in scale and it's probably a range. Um, but the, the big takeaway is you have to have a lot of man manure collected in one place. And if you have animals that are outside, they're not in a capo, their manure is being distributed on land. We have a, um, one of our viewers who has asked a question um, about your opinion on whether the UN Food Systems Summit might make corporate capture worse, given that they haven't had any focus on regenerative agriculture. 
Huh, that is a big question. <laughs> so I did do some reporting on the lead up to the UN Food Systems Summit. And um, I think there is a kind of feeling among some groups that a lot of the summit is tipping towards kind of big industrial food interests and not so much involving um, groups that are pushing more agroecological approaches to food production and um, uh, regenerative methods. However, I don't think the UN Food Systems Summit has a huge impact on US agriculture at the end of the day. Um, it might have a bigger impact internationally but I think U.S. agriculture is so powerful, the U.N. doesn't really um, impact how we do things here to a large extent. Okay, we have lots of questions coming in. Um, <laughs> Anaerobic All digestion right. and climate solutions have been given lots of attention, presumably because of their benefits. Are there alternate technologies you recommend that could help make meaningful change? And then there's a follow-up to this, which is, what about co-digestion anaerobic digesters that use municipal green bin waste or other organic waste streams beyond just manure-only digesters? Uh, yeah, I think that those digesters I think it could be really cool. Like if you can, if you can, you're putting food waste, you're getting all this different waste. And th there are a million ways to do this that I think, I don't think it's just like, this is a bad thing. Um, my intention was to kind of just show that when we start to propose um, these solu like solutions, then kind of companies come in and, and do what they will with them. But um, that doesn't mean that there aren't, situations in which digesters could be amazing and make perfect sense. Um, I, and I think you, it really will have to kind of be um, on a case by case basis um, that we think about like, does it make sense here? And is it really representing a meaningful reduction in emissions? Um, in terms of other technologies, um, I mean, I think one of the big issues is that it's really hard to get um, policymakers to think about agriculture as a more holistic system and kind of invest in um, full system solutions. So like we already know that diversified production, um, silvopasture, uh, we know that there are these systems that I mean, a lot of people will, will call it, you know, regenerative, and I would call it regenerative organic that that do a better job, but they require and they use a lot of technology. And by the way, like the most scientific technological thing you can do is start talking about soil health. And so I, I like to point that out because I hate when people think like organic is like anti tech or, um, but. but it, it just, those kinds of solutions could be supported and expanded, but I think it's harder because they're not just, well, we can change this one input or we can build this one thing. They require kind of holistic thinking and systemic shifts, and it's a much bigger um, lift to do those things. Um, and it's also not always the people who have power that are, are the ones um, really kind of um, working on these bigger solutions. Okay. What would regenerative agriculture and smaller scale farmers have liked to see in the Growing Climate Solutions Act to benefit them? Um, that's a good question. I, well, so I think this act in particular is, it was written completely for carbon markets. So um, I don't know that I don't know that there's a way that groups and farmers in those groups would want to be included in the markets. I think that they would just m more likely want support to do the kinds of things that they're they're already doing and, and be rewarded in the same way that some of their fellow farmers are um, that aren't using the same climate-friendly practices. So 
one, one thing a lot of um, groups that represent farmers and other um, environmental groups are calling for is an expansion of conservation programs um, at the USDA level. So uh, expanding the conservation programs like EQIP and CSP, but also updating them and improving them so that you know things like um, soil health and diversification and ecosystem stewardship are ranked higher in these programs. And so farms that are doing that will qualify um, for grants and funding to um, support their operations ahead of an operation that maybe is just making a small tweak to a commodity system. So I, th I think that that's something that gets talked about, about a lot. Um, and there's also some really, there's a big push now for investment in um, regional infrastructure that I think could help um, shift things a lot, even though it doesn't sound like it's climate policy. Um, a lot of farms, like the one that I mentioned at the end, um, that if, if you're doing if you're doing livestock on pasture and you're trying to compete with um, <laughs> the giant meat market we have in this country, and then you can't get your animals processed for three years, that's what the weight is right now in a lot of places for small producers. There's just no way at the end of the day you're going to be able to have a viable operation. So investing more, putting more dollars into small scale processing, um, food hubs that help um, distribute, more efficiently distribute uh, food from smaller, more diversified farms, things like that. I think even though they don't aren't climate policy on, like, you know, they don't, they might have climate in, in the title, they actually might be what those kinds of farms will ask for. And I think we just need to kind of think a little more systemically. Okay, we'll do one more question before you wrap up. A benefit, if there is one, of scale farms is that if they make real changes, then the impact is large. Are there examples of medium to large operators that are doing good? There definitely are. And, and that is, um, it's a really good point because like I said at the beginning, I didn't mean, I wasn't in any way saying big is bad. And um, there are two ways of thinking, I think in agriculture and in many other places, which is like, if a big operation, a big farm or a big food company makes a tiny change, then a lot of people would say that's better than a lot of small farms making big changes because they have such an outsized impact, right? So those are just two different ways of thinking about things. Um, I don't necessarily, you know, it, it was a long conversation about um, which is right or, or kind of backing either side up, but, um, but I do think there's lots of um, examples of bigger operations doing things well. And there's also just, it doesn't have to be one or the other, like there's mid scale, like there are farms, there's like a farm in Massachusetts called Kitchen Girl Farm that I think is amazing that um, is doing fruits and vegetables. I, I don't know if they had like a hundred acres or something, but they have regional production. Their, their vegetables are in Whole Foods there, but they're, so they're, they're not a small farm just selling at a farm stand or at a farmer's market, but they're not, you know, part of the Central Valley shipping their stuff all over the country either. So there's, there's a whole range of farms and production scales, and it doesn't have to be like, it has to be tiny or it has to be um, you know, the most, the highest example of, of what we want it to be. Um, I think there'll be a range of scales. Um, and, um, uh, sorry, I, now I'm like, just, I keep talking. I know we're ending, but, uh, I think one thing about scale too, is that replicability, re <laughs> is, that, is that the right word, um, is really important. So, um, if, if you create a kind of a mid-scale operation that is, is doing really great work, I think one question that doesn't get, it's always like, well, can it scale? Are we gonna make it, be able to make it big enough to feed people? But it doesn't necessarily have to scale. It could be replicated. So there could be a lot of something good rather than one thing doing everything, right? Awesome, thank you. Well, we are out of time. I wanna to apologize to the folks who we didn't get to their questions, but thank you for such active listening today. Um, thank you, Lisa, for such an interesting presentation. 
And thank you to everybody who's joined us today. And I know many of you join throughout the summer for each of our talks in the lecture series. So um, thank you so much. If you missed any or want to go back and watch again, they're all available to view online, both on the BLS YouTube channel and at vermontlaw.edu backslash live under past events. Thanks again, everyone. Have a great rest of your summer.